Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Paul Snellgrove. I'm the Associate Scientific Director of the Ocean Frontier Institute and a professor at Memorial University. I want to recognize that the Ocean Frontier Institute's physical offices are located on ancestral and traditional territories of diverse Indigenous groups in Atlantic Canada. Our Institute is working hard to advance respectful and meaningful partnerships with Indigenous peoples. Welcome to the Ocean Frontier Institute's Social Sciences and Humanities Working Group, People and the Ocean Speaker Series. This is the fourth of eight webinars this year featuring international experts who seek to understand complex interactions between society, economy, culture, and marine and coastal environments. Thank you all for coming and my sincere thanks to the working group for organizing this most impressive webinar series. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Evan Andrews, a postdoctoral fellow from Memorial University's Geography Department and a key member of OFI's Social Science and Humanities Working Group. So he'll introduce today's speaker and discussants and moderate today's session. Evan. Thank you so much, Paul, uh, for your introduction and, and land acknowledgement. So hello, everyone, and, and welcome to this fourth installment of the speaker series today. I am so excited uh, to introduce the speaker and two discussants uh, for today's seminar. So I'll start with some introductions. Our speaker today is Dr. Marlos Cran, who will share a presentation titled, How Can We, Marine Social Scientists, Become More Relevant? Dr. Cran is a marine social, science, uh, social scientist working as a researcher at the Applied Research Institute, Wageningen Ec Economy Research, and at the Environmental Policy Group in Wageningen University. She is co-director of the Center for Maritime Research in Amsterdam, member of the St Strategic Initiative on Human Dimension in ICES, and co-chair of the Working Group on Social Indicators. Marlos is interested in contributing to increasing inter and transdisciplinarity in maritime research, interactive fisheries governance, and improving the applicability of social science and fisheries science and policy. Our two discussants for today are Professor Jan Petter Johnson and Dr. Robert Stevenson. Professor Johnson works at the Norwegian College of Fisheries Science in, at UIT, the Arctic University of Norway. Since 2006, his research has focused on fisheries and aquaculture management and organization and processes of change in marine industries and marine communities in the North Atlantic. He also has experience from professional work in the fishing industry. Dr. Stevenson is a research scientist with the Canadian Department of Fisheries and Oceans and visiting research pro professor at the University of New Brunswick. From 2010 to 2016, he was principal investigator of the Canadian Fisheries Research Network that linked academics, industry, and government in collaborative fisheries research across Canada. Current research interests of his include development of strategies and governance for full spectrum sustainability of marine activities, including the inter integration of ecological, economic, social, cultural, and institutional aspects of management. So thank you all three of you for dedicating your time to the seminar. And I just wanna tell you a little bit about how today will go. Dr. Cron will take about 30 minutes to deliver her presentation. Then Professor Johnson and Dr. Stevenson will provide their comments. Dr. Cron will have a chance to respond and together they will get our discussion going. Then we'll move to a broader Q&A. So if you're joining us in the audience today, welcome. And your job is to enjoy this wonderful talk and interaction and get ready to ask some questions and join the discussion during the Q&A uh, uh, period. Please do keep yourself muted throughout as well as post your brief comments and questions in the Q&A box we have lots of time as a group to move this conversation forward after our present, uh, uh, presenter and discussants. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Marlos Kron. Thanks a lot for your kind words, Evan, and for uh, shouting out the resume. Always nice to hear. Um, I'm really happy to be here. And I also uh, glanced through the participants list and I recognized many names. So um, welcome everyone. And I'm really happy you're all here. To, um, yeah, to discuss uh, with us on this important topic. Um, I will now share my screen and take you away. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so 
the topic of today is how can we marine social scientists, and if you're not a marine social scientist, uh, you might want to become one, or you might want to comment on the topic and uh, join us for this discussion. So how can we become more relevant for policy? That's the key question of today. And I'm really happy uh, that I've been invited to join this uh, nice lineup of uh, people and the Ocean Speaker series, um, because I think uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's just an um, a good group to be part of, and I'm, I'm really happy to have the floor to have this discussion. So um, what I'll be talking uh, about is that there is more and more demand for marine social science, um, yet there is not really yet a standard group of people that can be found. Um, not easy enough, I think. So that's, that's basically the, uh, the background of the talk. Um, and let's uh, maybe start on a positive uh, uh, side here. Um, let me see, I have to want to do something about my controls here. Okay. Um, when I started studying cultural anthropology, I did that in 1994, and that was the second highest peak of unemployment rates in the Netherlands after the Second World War. So basically, when you would be doing a study like cultural anthropology, um, people would say, oh, you're becoming educated to become unemployed. Um, finding a job as an anthropologist was really not uh, the outlook at that time. Anthropology also is the typical example of, uh, of a fun study that people refer to or of something interesting, but what can you actually do with it? Um, however, I actually have a job. I have a really cool job. And uh, if you are studying anthropology or doing another social science and you're wondering if you can actually get a job, I think we can be positive about that. I think there's quite some work out there. Um, so that's the positive note, right? But then this is basically the talk. So it's a growing field and there is growing attention for applied marine social science, which is really great. But, and that's the, the second part of the talk, time is not on our side. Um, the topics that we work with are really urgent and uh, things are progressing and the world is changing rapidly. As we all know, many things are happening at the same time. So we also need to kind of speed up. So that's the background for this talk. And um, there we go. As a disclaimer, because I realized that this will be on YouTube and, and also the audience is quite broad, right? It's people from Canada, the States, Europe, Australia, and hopefully also from other parts of the world. Um, I think it's good to say that I focus on fisheries as a topic for a marine social scientist. Uh, there, of course, there are many other topics that you can talk about. I also tell a Dutch story or perhaps a European story. I do think that in the global south, perhaps more attention for social science is available and also on the on the radar of, um, of politicians and policymakers. As from the 90s onwards, a lot of livelihoods research has taken place. Um, and another disclaimer that I should make here is that I focus when I talk about applied marine social science, I focus on advice to government. Um, but I definitely realize that there are many other ways to be applied. And there are also many other ways to have impact as a scientist or to be relevant. But this is just um, my context. There is a growing interest for marine social science, um, I think. And uh, a nice indicator of this and an indicator I'm really happy with as a director of, um, of MARA is that the participants to MARA conferences have, have been growing um, quite a lot in the last couple of years. In the beginning, we were a small conference um, with about 150 people. But more recently, and especially last year, we had almost 650 people. This was also an effect of the fact that it was a virtual conference. So people could actually join from all over the world from sitting behind their computer. Um, but it, I think it's a really nice indication how, how uh, interest for marine social sciences is growing. Another nice indicator is the amount of books we publish at the Center for uh, Maritime Research in Amsterdam. Beautiful books, really thick. Um, a lot of detailed information is out there. There are two important journals, Maritime Studies and Marine Policy, that really publish a lot of articles. I mean, you could easily fill up the Dublin Library with all the information that is out there on marine social science. However, that is academic information. It's in books, it's in articles, but I have not yet met a policymaker 
or someone working for policy that has a lot of time to read all the articles, right? So how do we get that information that is out there to the, to the desks of the people that can do something with it in, a, in an easy and attractive way? Um, also, yeah, so apart from the fact that marine social science is really, really big and growing, um, interest for marine social science is also really growing in the applied marine science world. I'm active in, uh, in NICES community, and NICES is, uh, is a network of scientists, predominantly ecologists and biologists, um, but increasingly also economists and social scientists uh, working in the, in the Northeast Atlantic. Uh, PISIS is, the, is kind of the colleague organization looking at another big part of the ocean. And um, within ISIS, we have developed a strategic initiative on the human dimension. So, so really pushing from within the system of ISIS for more attention for the human dimension. And um, the two organizations together have uh, organized uh, the MCs conference, which I'm sure you're all well aware of. If not, make sure you are aware of it. Um, and the next MCs conference had to take place, I think, already two years ago, but due to COVID, this has been um, delayed. Uh, so this will come up hopefully this year or maybe next year. Um, but, it, but it indicates, again, this, this kind of growing demand for interdisciplinary work and definitely a lot of interest for uh, marine social science. People want to understand better why people do what they do. They better want to understand how we have governed things. So that's definitely happening. Also from the policy side, you see that there's more attention. And um, in Europe, um, our policy is driven by the Common Fisheries Policy, which is a, a policy uh, um, uh, managing uh, European oceans and seas. And the commissioner, um, I think he started in 2018 or 19, uh, Sinkevicius, demanded for the coming years to have a closer look at what he calls the social dimension of fisheries. Uh, I think this is also funny, you know, as social scientists, if we hear people from another disciplinary background talk about our work, it's always about dimensions, social or human dimensions. Um, really nice container concept. Um, but, the, but the demand is there. And also last year, I think the first uh, report uh, that was written on social aspects of the CFP was actually published and it was written by the SECF. And for the people not familiar, familiar with Europe, SECF is a bunch of scientists advising the commission, right? So a really applied group of people. Um, on a smaller scale, in the Netherlands, the attention for social science is also really growing. Uh, last year, uh, the parliament has adopted a motion uh, basically asking the minister to pay more attention to what they uh, have asked for, the social economic impact of policy on uh, the industry but not only on the industry, but also on the chain and fisher communities. And I think this is, uh, this is a really cool development, eh? that, that the realization is there, that policy developments that are taking place have a major impact on the social side of the system. Whereas, um, yeah, you could say historically, policy tends to focus on the impact on the ecosystem and the, on the biology, on the ecology. The minister specifically also mentioned in her response to the motion that she will give attention to the social and cultural value of fisheries. And so again, from the demand side, attention for the social part of the system is growing. So the question that we need to discuss, I think, is how do we build a good applied bridge? So we have that ivory tower still, I would say, of um, academic social work. And how, we, how do we make a proper connection? How do we capitalize on what is out there? How do we organize? How do we develop clear approaches? How do we find the right people on time? So if we, if we deconstruct that analogy of bridges, right? And if we would, would take this picture to kind of portray a social world, which we study, a science island and a policy island, right? All part of the social world, of course, but analytically, let's divide it up like this. So we have a really strong bridge from the marine social world to science, which is called marine social science. What we need is a bridge from academic social science to policy, uh, what we can call applied marine social science. The question is, what kind of bridge do we need? What should it look like? Should it be a two-way bridge? Um, should policy officers be 
drinking coffee and tea at, at our universities, talking with us about what they need all the time? Should it be us being with them? How, you know, how broad would the bridge be? Is it a temporary bridge or is it, uh, is it, is it um, solid? Also, what we could discuss is, um, should we make use of the bridge that is already there? Uh, the bridge that's connecting um, marine science with policy uh, being dominated currently by natural sciences and economics. Do we join them? Um, do we work interdisciplinary or do we do both? Do we have our own bridge or do we um, do everything together? So that's basically what I want to talk about. And, and then the question is, so what are these bridging activities that, that I'm, I'm thinking of, right? So I think it is important to have that bridge and I think it's important to think of um, building networks. And building networks is this combination of institutionalizing and drinking beer or tea for that matter. So I think the working group social within ISIS is a nice example of such a network. Because WG social is there, people have a place to go and to ask questions and to collaborate and to um, uh, work together. Another bridging activity that I think uh, is important is to translate. Um, for instance, indicators, which is the, the main focus of WG Social so far, uh, to develop indicators, because indicators are beautiful boundary concepts uh, between science and policy, often still seen as uh, something quantitative, but I think we can also think of qualitative indicators. And uh, we, we should, of course, also discuss how you need qualitative social science to understand the story that the indicators tell us. Um, translating also is about tuning your message and choosing your format to the audience that you're speaking to, right? So write a policy brief or have a webinar. Simplifying is also really important, um, yet of course stay grounded. Um, but for instance, develop a toolbox. Another bridging activity is that it's really important to understand each other's realities. If you want to work with policy, then you have to understand the time, the timing aspect and what are the, the, the key political debates and what's the context of the policy that's developing and vice versa, of course. Science also has its own reality and its own speed. Science is often really slow and that kind of tuning is something that's really important. Uh, you should also, of course, talk about the credibility and the legitimacy and the saliency of science that you're developing. But, you know, bridging activities are also training, educating, emancipating, demonstrating, simplifying, evangelizing, perhaps, observing, listening, and, of course, making jokes, making a little bit of fun uh, together. So simplify. An example, um, if you talk about social science and what it is, um, it really helps if you can bring it down to something simple. So what do we do as marine social scientists? Well, we ask four basic questions to understand the social system to be governed. Um, what do people do? What do people know? What do people have? That's basically what we spend our time with. And then, of course, the fourth question, why? Because we always want to understand what's happening. And we often do this from their perspective. So we don't write stories about this is the truth, but we always try to say this is how people perceive their reality. And topics that we work on, for instance, are Fisher behavior, uh, rules of a system, uh, Fisher's ecological knowledge, or the socioeconomic value of fishing. Tune the message to your audience, I think, is another really important bridging activity that we should become stronger in. For instance, uh, together with Amanda Schadeberg and Katel Hamon, we wrote this article last year on um, better understanding fisher behavior. Um, the article is there, that's really cool, but let's also make an infographic. Let's uh, make a drawing that kind of simply shows what we wrote about and why it is important. And my colleague Emily Liang at EMP did a really fantastic job on this. And we can then use that for social media, which is another platform that you can use as a scientist to communicate your work. Um, we also wrote an article in Dutch in Fishing News so that the fishermen and, and their wives could actually read about the work that we uh, had done and in which we had engaged them uh, whilst we were developing it. So, so this kind of bringing it back to the people that you work with, I think is also really important. Develop a toolbox is also a way uh, that you can kind of um, progress in this, in this 
in this bridge work, so to say. Yeah. So both in the Pericles project, we developed a toolbox as in the GAP2 project. Um, the one was looking at uh, marine and coastal heritage and the other was looking at uh, cooperative science. And, and these toolbox boxes or, or guidebooks um, actually also contribute to simplifying and explaining what it is that you do and perhaps also inspiring other people to, to pick up um, methods or, or approaches that, that you would normally do yourself uh, so that you can do it together or maybe they do it themselves. Well, other bridging activities obviously are um, the social science method course that we developed for um, people working at ISIS for natural scientists. So in three days to have a better understanding of certain methods that we use as um, social scientists. But also organizing a policy day in connection to your conference, I think is important or write a column, give a webinar, have exchanges. I think uh, the exchange program that we had Again, as the GAP2 project with the Canadian Fisheries Research Network is a really nice example of, of bridging activities um, where you travel together, talk together, learn a lot about each other's realities. Um, another example is I think the work that we undertook uh, within ISIS at, as WG Social. So ISIS um, creates ecosystem overviews to kind of give a summary of how an ecosystem is functioning and um, describing the main pressures in the system. And when we as social scientists were reading ecosystem overviews, we were always struck by the fact that there was this map indicating major ports in, uh, in an ecoregion. Um, but there was not a lot of kind of um, social in an ecosystem overview even though ISIS recognizes that humans are part of the ecosystem. So one of the concrete uh, little steps, baby steps perhaps, that we proposed and which was um, wholeheartedly accepted by ISIS was to develop um, maps with fisher communities. And then we used ports as an, as an indicator, you could say, of fishing communities. Um, so we basically put fisher communities on the map so that we could show what the impact was of fisheries often a major impact in an ecosystem overview um, for society. And so the fisheries also bring something, they have a certain value. And I think one of the other things that it really nicely demonstrates is how communities from Norway to Spain are actually active and, and profiting um, and, and building on what is happening in that ecoregion. Okay, so these are all kind of examples of bridging activities that we can undertake and that we are undertaking. Of course, there are a couple of dilemmas um, and I think this might be nice for the discussion. So um, if you think back of the analogy of these islands that we're trying to, um, to, uh, to bridge to, um, there are always people that actually prefer to stay on their island. There are scientists that rather not engage with policy. Um, or that rather not uh, do a webinar or that, you know, prefer writing books or articles. Okay. Some also fear that making use of the natural science bridge waters down uh, the social science. That's another kind of barrier that I think we need to talk about. Some say, I don't want to work for government. Um, that's an interpretation of course, but I think it's also a reality that we need to discuss. Some say don't train them, eh? thinking of the three-day course that we give for natural scientists. Um, we have done a four-year study. Um, how, how on earth do you think you can train them in three days? Uh, you're, you're oversimplifying what it is that we do. Okay, you can teach, teach them a couple of methods, but you know where's the theory? And what is social science without contributing to theory? A toolbox, my God, as if a non-social scientist can do it right. Interviewing a fisherman, pff, it will never work. Yeah, so these are the kind of um, discussions that I think we should have and, um, and talk about. Because also, I'm, I'm thinking of building a landscape of marine social science. And, and we don't all have to become jack-of-all-trades. We don't all have to do everything 
Um, but we can better work together, I'm sure. And so if you wrote this fantastic book, cool. Talk about it with someone who can actually write um, uh, an article about it in more common language, or that can actually use the method you developed and um, do something with it, right? So, so I would really want to kind of talk together about how can we build that landscape where we all have a part of the system in our hands. And if we bring that together, we actually see that we have an elephant standing there. Um, another part of the discussion I think that we, we should talk about is, um, is, is portrayed in this, this really nice figure that uh, was in the article that we wrote with uh, uh, Rob Stevenson. And is that um, if you want to kind of uh, bring in uh, social, social objectives in assessment, uh, which, we, which you basically do, there are a couple of pathways of how to do that. And um, so, so business as usual basically is figure A, where often the ecological objectives are on the forefront of the mind of the policymakers. The research is done to support and to to understand you know, what the limits are and what, what can be done. Um, for instance, a TAC, uh, a, a total allowable catch is, is calculated. And then uh, often in the, in the policy mix, uh, social, cultural, economic and institutional objectives are kind of discussed and then boom, that's, that's there. Um, but there are other ways of, of weighing uh, social, cultural, economic, and institutional objectives, and bringing that, bringing the science in the assessment system. So um, you could think of a sequential pathway where you kind of first do the ecological work, and then you look at the social, cultural work, and then the economic and the institutional, or you kind of do it as separate teams, or you have, and that's option D, have an integrated process where you kind of uh, all work together. Or vice versa, you start with human dimension and then you look at ecological uh, consequences, right? So I think this is another part of the discussion that might be nice to, um, to look into. So all of that is great, right? So I've been talking about this, gr this growing field and, and what we can do to build bridges. But um, we don't have a lot of time to do that. And one of the things that kind of um, not frustrate me, but make me a bit... Uh, and not at ease is this urgency and, and the slowness of us developing this, uh, this process. Because um, as I said, the matters at hand are really urgent. And, and to illustrate that, I'd like to take you to the Netherlands. And basically the fleets are really under pressure. Um, this is a, a recent post of, uh, of a fisher group in the Netherlands uh, uh, listing the vessels that will be decommissioned. Um, and if you look at, the, at the, the names of the vessels, you see that they come from various communities in the Netherlands, from Tessel, from Arnhemuiden, from Wieringen, from Tolen, from Goederede and from Urk. So it's, 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 and it's happening now, right? Um, so we can't really take a lot of time to talk about how to organize ourselves because things are happening and, and fishermen are feeling the pressure of the combination of the landing obligation, um, the, the ban on pulse fishing, which is a really important fishing technique in the Netherlands, which is not an option anymore. Uh, the development of marine protected areas also um, having impact on the amount of space that they have to do their fishing. Uh, wind farms, and I'm sure we're all familiar with that around the world. Uh, Brexit, making the ocean uh, a, a space or the sea space where fishers can actually go fishing even smaller. New policy developments. The European Union has accepted a Green Deal, which is getting a lot of um, uh, traction and attention. And, and it, it, you know, we have a common fisheries policy, but but it is not about fisheries anymore. It's about other activities and other uh, high level um, objectives that we need to reach as, as a society. There is this um, blue growth ambition that Europe has, right? So the clock is ticking. So the question is, and the shout out is, how can we quickly become more relevant? And how can we, at the same time, lobby for more in-depth research, because I also feel uncomfortable with quickly doing stuff, advising policymakers, 
um, without doing it thoroughly. I want to do years of field work in these fishing communities whilst they're still there. But yeah, that yeah, I understand that that's not really an option, right? So, so how can we somehow do both? More in-depth research, long-term data collection, but also be quick and perhaps not dirty. And where is the link between applied marine social science that I've been talking about, but also advising to have more participatory governance so that fishers themselves can bring their ideas to the fore? And, and also, how is this really different? Yeah? And I think, uh, again, context, but in the Netherlands, fishery sector um, representation organizations are actually collapsing um, um, due to all the pressure that they're under. And um, uh, so, so that's another kind of um, contextual lack of time, uh, things are changing um, aspect. Okay, so that was my talk and I'm curious to hear what um, Rob and uh, Jan will bring to this and uh, talk about it. Thanks. And, and thanks to all my colleagues for um, working on, on this with me. Thank you so much, Marla, for a wonderful uh, presentation. So now we're going to turn to our discussant comments, and we'll start with Jan Petter. Yeah, thank you uh, for inviting me, and thank you very much, Marlous, for a fascinating talk. Um, I should start here by uh, saying a little bit about the context. We are Norway is not the EU member. So we are not a part of the of the common fisheries policy, but we collaborate with the EU in, in uh, many fields. We have a, a, a common uh, labor market. We have a common market. We sell all our goods and, and there are also an open market for services and things like that. But the fishing sector in Norway is not a part of the, of the common fisheries policy. So, we, so it's, we are, we are in a different situation. I'm working at the Norwegian College of Fishery Science, which is um, uh, uh, today an uh, institute under the Department of Biosciences, Fisheries and, and uh, Economics at the University of Tromsø in Tromsø in Northern Norway. Um, and uh, the institution was established as an interdisciplinary institute in an interdisciplinary university in the early 1970s. In the 1990s, the, the people the, who have worked in the interdisciplinary uh, departments wanted to go back to their disciplines. Fortunately, the Fisheries College survived. So we have a special responsibility for education of people to the fisheries sector. We still do interdisciplinary uh, education. We are an interdisciplinary group of researchers. I myself, I'm educated from here, so I have this background, I know nothing about everything. That's basically the, <laughs> my, my, my competence, but we are also closely connected to the sector. Um, the, the faculty here are, are quite often involved in expert committees, uh, asked, uh, set up by the government to give advice in, 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 uh, in uh, uh, fisheries, uh, administration or, or arrangements or things like that. And we also have a quite open line to the, to the government in, in terms of that if we, if, we, if we have projects that are applied, it's quite easy to get them into reference groups. We don't have steering committees. They can't control what we are doing, but they are, they are willing to sit in reference groups. I just came for a, uh, from a meeting where we had both the ministry and the directorate of fisheries participating in discussions about uh, research and, and results just before I came into this meeting. So we are in a, in a little bit different situation from what you described, Marus. Um, we also have to publish internationally. We have uh, uh, we 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 uh, we experience the same as you do that that uh, administrators doesn't read the scientific journals. So we have to actually find other formats, talks at meetings. We are quite often collaborating with or, or giving talks at the fishermen's organizations uh, meeting or to the ministry, uh, and we are also doing a lot of applied uh, projects. In a, in a way, but we of course feel this 
tension between being relevant on one side and and uh, uh, that we shall not be in the pocket of the authorities also that we we shall have the the academic freedom the last what shall i say our main product are our students we last years we have had 30 between 25 and 30 what we call fisheries candidates who have graduated from the our our programs and and at least half of them go into the public sector into the fisheries directorate into the ministry or to municipality or county administration so in a way i feel that we are relevant and that we 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 continuously work to be relevant so but for us it may be uh, we have a, a different challenge is to be somehow accepted in the academic world because we are interdisciplinary we are not in disciplinary experts we do not always uh, uh have the use the right methods or 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 know the, the the latest theories and things like that but we are uh, communicating with the sector. I don't think this is unique for Norway. I think our, as you know, Marlies, the Innovative Fisheries Management Institute in Aalborg in Denmark, I think have been in a kind of similar position that they have worked as experts doing, doing, doing research. So if I should give an advice to become more relevant, I would say set up a fisheries college, interdisciplinary fisheries college. <laughs> And start to train people for the for the EU <laughs> uh, for Digi Mare. That that may help. <laughs> Not so many lawyers and and economists. More interdisciplinary people into the bureaucracy. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jan. Thank you, Jan Peter. Rob. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. First, uh, thanks. Marlos, for an excellent and thought-provoking um, talk. It's, uh, I note that there, we are over 70 on the call, which is uh, really very good. So you see there's great interest in, in this topic. Um, a few things, a few notes, and then a couple of questions. First, there are similarities in Canada and elsewhere. You started your talk by suggesting that it was a Dutch story, but of course, it's, it's very much greater than that. There is increasing appreciation of the human dimension and the need for interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary and social aspects. There's also uh, increasing evidence of that rift that you mentioned between academic social science uh, research and uh, practical management in spite of what Jan Petter um, has said about about that in Norway. And, and in, indeed, there is this enormous sense of urgency as uh, coastal communities and livelihoods crumble uh, and they face uh, great change, climate change and, and, and social change. So those things are common and, and, and wide, widespread. I think things are very different today than they were you know, over a decade ago when, when you and I were, were we're talking about this and frustrated by the lack of uptake of, of some of this thinking in that I, I think this need is becoming more recognized and it's becoming mainstream, right? That, that the stars are lining up. The sustainable development goals indicate that need. Um, changes in, in legislation in Canada and elsewhere is evidence of increased appreciation of, of this need. But it doesn't happen with the flip of a switch, right? It doesn't. It doesn't happen easily. We uh, we we speak different languages in in, in these different aspects. Um, I think your bridge analogy is 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 quite good, and in fact, I think it's perhaps an improvement in that it's more positive on the the silos that we used to talk about <laughs> years ago because it, it's more constructive, right? But 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 the point is the you know what type of bridge you ask that question and that's a, that's a, a a critical point because not everything can cross every type of bridge and you know you need the roads leading to the bridge the flow across the bridge has to be enough that things can get across and so on so on so 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 there's it, it's not trivial you can't flip a switch on on the move to this interdisciplinarity even um though we we might want to 
I was I was really impressed with your notion of a full and connected landscape, or I would call it a seascape. I think, uh, given given our fields um, of of marine social science, and indeed marine science that includes uh, appropriately the social aspects um, as a cohesive unit. And that brings me to my questions. You've done more bridge building and and more uh, than than most in terms of trying to cross these disciplines and. I wanted to ask you what your recommendations would be for urgent move towards that landscape or seascape. Is it more of the same? Can we get there with more of the types of activities you mentioned? Or do we need to structure things differently? Or, or have you got ideas about what the, the, the most profitable and fastest way to improve this would be? How can we overcome the dilemmas that you mentioned? Thanks. Thank you so much, Rob. So I'll just remind attendees at this point that they can start uh, putting in some questions and comments into the Q&A box. Uh, but before we get to those, I'm going to turn back to Marla, see if she has any uh, responses to Jan Peter, uh, Jan Petter and, and Rob's uh, comments. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think it's really unfair, Rob, to to now let me solve the dilemmas, right? So <laughs> I'm just going to ignore that <laughs> and hope that everyone will actually pitch in to solve all these uh, dilemmas Indeed. that I that I presented. Indeed, so, I ask it for discussion. Yes. Jokingly, yeah, no, good point. Now, so, and also, uh, uh, Jan Petter, thank you for, for indeed giving this little mini lecture of how things work in Norway, which is really good because I think uh, uh, we, we are not always aware of that and, and things are always organized differently. I love the idea actually of having an uh, international fisheries college. Um, um, and, and I would love to train people who, who will start working at DG Mare. Um, but I'm also very much aware of the fact that uh, if you want to have a career in Europe, then fisheries is really not the place to be. <laughs> so there is, there is not really a, a specialized group of bureaucrats who really understand fisheries and then work at DG Mare. I mean, saying that respectfully, many people at DG Mare actually do understand fisheries. But, but if they want to move on to another field, they do that, right? And that, that's how policy officers' uh, careers kind of move around. And, and what I also realized uh, from, from the people working at the ministry in the Netherlands, also there, it's not a career path. It's something you do for a couple of years. And we sadly see them going again. And then we have to train new people in, in this really complex field of fisheries. And so, so, so that makes it difficult. Um, I, as I said, I would love that it would work that way. Um, but but perhaps there are many good arguments that that it is really good for policy officers to move around and do all sorts of things. Um, I think also the point that you alluded to that um, uh, what you do perhaps is not so much accepted in the academic world is another kind of dilemma that we might want to talk about because why why um, and do we then have to be jack, jack of all trades? Do we have to be this groundbreaking theoretical developer and do all the other impact, impact work? Or can we actually have more of a team, team effort? And, and I think that also, yeah, that's, that, to give an answer to you, Rob, I think this is also one of the things we need to talk about. How do we organize our science? Why, why do you grow in your career if you publish in A++++ whatever journals? And, and why are all the lectures and, 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 and popular uh, science articles not really counted? Or, or the organizational work that we uh, try to do, why is that not part of a good career in science? Yeah, so that's, I think that's another kind of a, a bomb under bridges that we might need to talk about. Uh, so looking at both uh, aspects. So yeah, um, yeah, I, maybe I should leave it with that for now. And uh, let's see what, uh, what the rest wants to uh, bring to the discussion. Uh, Rob or Jan Petter, do you have any responses to uh, what Marla just said? Uh, no, I <clears throat> I totally agree, Marlus. And and uh, I, again, I think this is uh, has also to do with history. Fishing has, all, has always been a very important sector in Norway, and we are a main fish exporter. And you actually people actually 
spend their whole life there even as academics as professionals also so we have a, a, a labor market for fisheries specialists which is different of, of course but but maybe that is also something we well the the dutch fishermen and european fishermen complain that when they meet norwegian fishers in negotiation the fishermen's organizations are always at by the table the eu fishers are have to sit in the corridor uh, the Norwegian fishermen bring with them their own experts, uh, uh, and they are allowed to speak in the in the, in the meeting. So the, it's also about national uh, differences, I think, and, and different cultures, uh, also. So, uh, so yeah. question: Do do people actually can they pursue a career as a policy officer in fisheries? Do people stay working at the ministry for years and years? Okay, that's well, interesting. Those who are educated from the fisheries college they stay in the ministry or in the fisheries directorate or they go to the private fishing industry for mm -hmm. lawyers and uh, political scientists and and people with disciplinary background they may move around uh, 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 a little bit but it's good to be a bureaucrat in in norway also so we see people who have a long uh, career there so it's a different picture from from the EU system also. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I believe I see some hope in, in that, um, whereas traditionally we in, in academic circles trained people to be academics, there, there is a, a, a greater understanding of the diversity of career types and of movement among career types now than there used to be. I'm thinking now of the of the students uh, developed during the GAP program in Europe and the uh, Canadian Fisheries Research Network who have been picked up in, in, in different employment. And, and some of our colleagues who, who were academic or government scientists now working with the fishing industry, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that there is some movement in that, but, but that, 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 only, that applies to, to employer not necessarily to discipline and and the, the issue of 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 um, as as noted in the MC's conference, we're not going to train fully uh, uh, intact um, interdisciplinary individuals. That re requires teams, teams mm -hmm. uh, with disciplinary difference and teams. I would say also with employment difference to solve these problems. I think that's that's actually critical, how we form these teams. They might come from academia and industry and government. Hopefully they, they will. But how do we get them together and, and allow them to be on the same page? Um, in Hobart at, at, at the uh, Center for Marine Social Ecology, they're very aware of training people uh, they're, who are T-shaped, they're, they're tall enough in various disciplines to be credible, but they have a wide enough reach with their arms to, to embrace other disciplines. Well, I think that, that, that has to occur across, across employment situations as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think that's the future. So we have some wonderful questions pouring in uh, for, for Marlos and, and, and indeed the discussants. So we're going to start with a question from Martin Bavink uh, for you, Marlos. Your sentence, your last sentence referred to the possibility that social scientists should connect not only to government policy, but also to fisher policy too. In Europe, fishers and government don't always uh, see eye to eye, and they not only have different knowledge needs, but perspectives as well. There is therefore a choice in terms of who are we actually trying to help here. Shouldn't we be building up Fisher organizations that can bring forward their views more convincingly? In other words, please let us uh, not only refer to government, but pay attention to Fisher struggles too. Do you have a response to this? Yeah, I, th I think that's, uh, yeah, that's a really good point, right? I mean, it, as I said, you kind of work two, two ways in two worlds. Um, and I think in the uh, GAP2 project, I think that's, that's kind of exactly what we try to do. So building these bridges two ways. Um, I guess uh, I, I guess one of the maybe the dilemmas or one of the one of the kind of the reality and practical things that we need to consider as well is that as scientists we we kind of work within projects and uh, and so Ed, so it's it's either a, a demand um, coming from a certain group, 
and often that's the government. Um, it, it does not happen so often that uh, fisher groups ask us to uh, to do work with them or for them. So that's kind of a, a I also a financial practical aspect um, that as an applied researcher, a contract researcher, you also need to uh, be aware of, I think. Yeah. And I think this is a, a sort of related uh, question from Lillian Saul, who's, who's asking about tools to, uh, other than, for example, peer reviewed outputs to support uh, fishers and, and influence policy. She asks, how do you consider filmmaking, even uh, short filmmaking, as a way to, you know, influence policy, or is that too disconnected? How do how do we how do we uh, create an impact? Yeah, I think I think that's a really great suggestion, and and actually something we we try to do as well, and, and are are trying to develop. A colleague of mine, Luz Witteveen, is um, has developed. A, um, uh, we we have used it a lot in uh, in re in um, education, and so we have short filmed interviews with a variety of stakeholders. Um, it's called VPA, uh, Visual Problem Appraisal, um, and then uh, students can actually choose which stakeholders they want to listen to, uh, and then choose those filmed interviews. Um, and based on the stories that they hear and then reflect on it, they kind of build an appreciation of what the problem is and, and how actors uh, function. And one of the things we try to develop in the Pericles project is if we could use VPA also as a tool in governance and in management. And what really is cool about it is that you basically bring uh, different stakeholders to the fore. Um, and so, so then the, the policy officers and the, and the fisher representatives and the NGOs can actually also pick interviews uh, that, they, that they watch, um, which, which allows for new people uh, stories to be heard in, in this policy context. And um, anyway, so, so yeah, I think filmmaking is, is a really nice idea. Um, yeah. Wonderful. So yep. I have a question here from Alida Bundy, and, and I'm going to ask this on her behalf to you, Marlos, but also open this up to uh, the two discussants as well. It takes two to tango. Can you talk about how the policy people are trying to uh, bridge to marine social science uh, sciences in, in your experience? Yeah, I, I agree. And, uh, and I think it, it one of the examples is, for instance, uh, uh, one of the people at DG Mara who is responsible for, for this social dimension uh, actually was really willing at, and, and was reaching out actively to the working group social, uh, participated also as an observer uh, in, our, in our meetings, uh, explaining to us you know, what, what the, the developments were from the policy side. Um, and then also kind of leaving it up to us again, right? But but he was he was kind of he was there and he was present and he was uh, really interested to to hear what we could do. And I think that kind of um, um, people that are willing to overstep those those boundaries and to explain, yeah, but this is our reality. This is what we're working on. What can you do? And to then have that discussion, I think that's really important. And uh, I happily, indeed, I know a couple of people who actually do that from the policy side to uh, to science. Yeah, but I, I don't know how that how that is in in Canada and in Norway. Rob, do you have anything to add to this question? Yeah, it, it, indeed, it, I think it's not happening sufficiently, but it 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 has to happen because we have to appreciate that that our our management is in, in, in our countries is objective based management. It's based on the, the um, acts and, and agreements and, and policies that we have, or it should be, but they need to be translated and operationalized through management. And then they need to be informed by various types of science and, and, and monitored. So it, we need to work together. And this, this is, um, the, the root of, of, of a long-standing suggestion that we really need a good dose of, of management science or operations research in here because we need to we need to get that right. We need to realize the, the way we work or should be working and we need to to make it smooth from policy to operation to action and, and, and to management. To me that, that, that's sort of a no-brainer. 
it doesn't make it easy to do because we are in separate silos. We're in separate areas and we, as, as was said before, speak different languages. But I think that has to happen. I, I think Elida's point is a very good one. And, and indeed, in the work that she's doing and that, that, that several of us are involved with, we're trying to operationalize it through objectives. Thank you. John Petter, did you want to take a stab at this one too? Uh, uh, again, it's, uh, it's probably an issue also related to to uh, to the the differences, you, both Canada and the EU, in a way, are federal, uh, federally organized. So, so there is a long distance between people and the the decision makers. In a unitary state like Norway, we 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 have it's a shorter distance between people and and the administration, and uh, and I think that is one of the explanations why we see these these differences also. Um, and and I don't feel that we have there is a problem that the government are not reaching out for us. They are they are obliged to ask for advice from competent people. They need a legal basis and a, a what should I say scientific basis for for the the proposals they put uh, forward. They, they they send to the politicians for decisions. The politicians can do what. Ever they want. They don't have to follow the administration's administrators' advice, but but the administration actually have to work on on uh, on on this basis. So stakeholders, uh, experts, and uh, and uh, the law has to be consulted for all decisions. So 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 the situations are are quite quite different, I think, from what you, from what you 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 tell here. Yeah. yeah. I think I think um, this legal basis sorry. aspect. Sorry, Evan, but that this legal basis aspect I think is also important. And what I what I also learned through WG Social is that apparently in the United States uh, it's it's mandatory to do social impact analyses for a lot of management decisions. Um, so there is this this kind of standard demand to look at the social part of the system, mm -hmm. which makes it really helpful. And and this is not the case in uh, in Europe. Um, and so I, I would say in Europe there there is this kind of um, but obviously you you need to take decisions on best available science, um, um, but there is no there is no strong hook yet in the policy for social science. Um, as Rob said, uh, the, there are objectives uh, in the CFP uh, that refer to the social uh, dimension, but they have not been operationalized. So so. And therefore, that process is so very, very slow. So we have a few questions now, uh, shifting a little bit towards who marine social scientists are, who they can be, um, and what they should be working on. And, and I, I, I'm going to try to summarize these a little bit. So I'm wondering, Marlos, uh, one, one uh, attendee would like to know a little bit more about how to account for the diversity in, in marine social science approaches and you know is that important uh, should we be a unified force um do you, do you have something to say about that yeah I, th I think i think you should do both right you should you should always start talking about the broad social science what is it that we do and at the same time um explain um, uh, how we look at different parts of that system in different ways um, uh, so, so where a geographer kind of has a bird's eye view, uh, an anthropologist uh, uh, tends to zoom in and, uh, and be really detailed uh, to, to use two stereotypical examples. And I think it's important that we explain um, to our natural science colleagues that, that social sciences is indeed a really broad um, a discipline or, or group of, of disciplines and, and all of them do different things and, and all of them can contribute. Uh, I know that Jan, Jan Petter talked about uh, training courses and it came up again. So if, if uh, the marine social sciences are, are so diverse, how do you get that into a short training course that is available for folks? Well, was it a question or? Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll keep uh, asking yeah. Marlos for this one. Yeah, How yeah. do you uh, deal with that? If it's, uh, well, if you're, if, you're, 
if you're referring to the, the training course that we developed for ISIS, there we, we focus on uh, talking about a couple of methods and, and methods are used by, by the different disciplines, right? So, so what is interviewing and how do you do that? And uh, what's, what's, what's mapping or what's, what is uh, participant observation? Um, so, so that then is, is the, the angle that we take. Um, by talking about the social science methods. But then again, if you, if you wanna go further and if you then want to talk about, so how do you analyze the data that comes out of, out of you know, the stuff that you do, then it really also depends on yeah, what's the question and what's the disciplinary uh, angle and what are the theories that you're using uh, to, to understand that part of the world that you're looking into. But obviously we cannot discuss that in a three-day course. And, I, and I have people that have taken the course actually said, I mean, some people fear that if you would do that, train them, and then they would just go off and do it. Um, what I know from the people that actually followed the course, many of them said, oh, oh, so that is what you guys do. Oh man, that's really complicated. I'm going to work with a social scientist in my team and let them do it, right? So, so I think it, it really is again about explaining what it is that we do so that you kind of understand. And then uh, the point is to kind of collaborate with social scientists. Rob? Am, am I right in, in, in saying that in many cases, the, the rift is so large that people don't have an appreciation for a lot of the words or, or the scope of it. And I, I don't I think these training courses, the short ones are meant to create much expertise at all in in the in the field, but but rather an appreciation of that, right? An appreciation of what tools are there and and what the scope is. And to me, that's that, that that's critical because otherwise you don't even know sort of what to ask about or 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 who to tap on the shoulder to, to bring into a team. Um, I, I think we we could do a lot to to facilitate team building in, in that way. Young Petter. Uh, I also think it's a question about uh, what we train people for, for what purpose we do it. If it is to train biologists to, in a way, expand their databases to publish more biological articles, I don't think that's uh, what we are talking about. We are basically talking about training people so they can communicate across disciplines. Uh, and I don't think, I think that can be, uh, it must not be a, a, a full training. It can be as Malus has done the, uh, some methods and start a reflection around it. And then to, to, to make it possible for people to communicate across the discipline. That's the, the biggest value from being in an interdisciplinary environment that we can speak a little bit to, to, to each other actually. <laughs> Well, and we have a, a question from Jill Campbell Miller, who's a historian recently hired by uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And she wonders uh, whether you've all considered the ways humanities can be brought into this uh, uh, conversation. For example, improving communication uh, to the public. Do any of you have thoughts on the role of humanities? So, and then I, I would need an explanation of what is humanities? Is, is history part of humanities or is that another other group of disciplines? Um, I'm not sure what, I, I believe that's what Jill is in, implying here. Yeah, yeah, but if it's, if it's yeah, about history, uh, yeah, yeah. History, literature and philosophy. Oh, what cool, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Jill. <laughs> Uh, there we go. We need to understand each other's worlds. No, so I, I, I would, I would love that actually. And uh, and I think all of these these um, disciplines are really important as well. I mean, if you want to understand where you are now, you have to understand where you're coming from, and um, and also philosophy. And uh, how do you how do you if 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 I would interpret one of the aspects of it is is how do you actually communicate to each other and and how do you how do you listen and what are ethical considerations that you take and, and uh, how do you reason? Yeah, for instance, if you would observe uh, policy officers talking to fisher, fishermen and fisher representatives, I think philosophy would be a fantastic discipline to, to use to analyze what kind of communication is actually going on. Are people talking with each other or is it a parallel monologue? All right, so um, 
Yeah, I would, I would love that. Actually, there is a, a working group HIST uh, in, in ISIS. I'm not, no, I don't know if you're aware of that, but there is a group of uh, historians and I think also biologists with a keen interest in history that are uh, doing great work there as well. So we have a question from uh, Han Lindeboom. In the Netherlands, uh, the fisheries are now killing themselves by not participating in stakeholder negotiations about the North Sea. What can social scientists do to help solve this problem? Yeah, that's a, that's a that's a it's a it's a good question. And uh, indeed, uh, as I said, uh, the, the fisheries organizations are are in um, in turmoil at, uh, uh, currently. So one of the one of the two large organizations um, actually kind of uh, split up and, and, and dissolved. Um, and they are in the process of reorganizing. People who have had an active role actually stepped down or had to step down. Um, so, so it's all a bit complicated, so to say. And indeed, a couple of um, fisher representatives um, definitely do not want to participate in a, in a governance-led uh, um, process to talk about how do we organize the North Sea. Um, and a part actually does want to sit at the table um, and participate. So, so they're, they're, they're not agreeing on what the best way forward is. And I guess this kind of, uh, his question also speaks to what Marta asked earlier. Uh, can we as social scientists, uh, where we study governance and governance processes, advise fisher organizations on how to, how to do this? I, yeah, I, th I think we can um, observe what's happening and we can uh, reflect with them on it. Um, yeah, I think we can play a role. But at the same time, I'm also really aware of the fact that um, that it is really complicated. I, I I kind of also understand. I understand the hesitance to to step into a process because I think also if we analyze the processes that are taking place, uh, you could really debate what the level of participatoriness is um, because are the goals of the process up for debate or is everything already set in stone and can you as a fisher only point out um, where your fishing grounds are and they might consider it right so so i think the dilemma is that we also have what we call participatory processes but but are they really participatory and and for policymakers a, a true participatory process is is really uh, difficult because a policymaker cannot negotiate with open hands. No, there is there is something that they need to um, uh, reach. Uh, so so anyway, really long story, but it's not so easy. <laughs> and and this is a bit of a follow up, I think, from Sarah Coulthard, who's asking um, how do marine social scientists make themselves more relevant to uh, fishers uh, in an era of research fatigue lack of trust and the perception that science isn't going to help them. Yeah, that's that's a good question. And I, I can only um, hope for us being um, relevant. I, yeah. I, f I find it a difficult question. I, I don't think I, I, I always when I engage with um, fishermen when I when I do research, I'm I'm I don't have the power to make the decisions. The only thing that I do is I, I study and I describe um, and I I then write about that, right? But but we don't have the acting power to then um, do something. So that's not our job. Our job is to do the research, but but it's yeah, it's it's a difficult one. But go ahead, Rob and Young. <laughs> I was just going to say that this brings up the broader question of of where to get traction and how to make make the most progress. Um, and related to that is the fact that we can't take on all issues at once with with a limited um, capacity and, and and a limited team, right? So I think that choosing the examples where people need 
to make decision and are willing to look at a broader disciplinary background is, is important. Some of that will take place in fisheries, but some of it, I think, quite frankly, may, may take place around adaptation of coastal communities to climate change, um, things like this, or, or areas where a new activity uh, such as wind farming is being proposed in a marine spatial planning type of setting, some, something like that, where people know that something's going to be disrupted and going to be changed and are then looking at the social aspects more carefully than they might have otherwise, or than they might be with a with a, a year over year fishery um, strategy. So I think that choosing battle, if you like, or choosing the case um, and demonstrating proof of concept is something that could be done strategically. Jan Petter. I also <clears throat> think it's a question about how we bring science in, in a way, as you said, Malus, what's your job? Well. Maybe that's not up to you to to define in 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 this respect. Maybe the the people who, who people will ask you to help them with 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 some issues, and then you sometimes have to 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 leave your your job uh, your job description at your desk, and then see is it possible to work with with people in the in in in, in the right way. But but you know these things. You are an anthropologist, so you are used to interacting with 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 people. But it also there maybe uh, at least in Norway we get some criti criticism because we are not involved enough in debates on in newspapers, social media, and things like that. That yeah. that may be also one way of of uh, engaging with, with with the field that we actually take a stand and try to bring out some information in that way. Mm -hmm. Rob, you mentioned capacity and, and this question goes for, for all three of you. Um, what ideas do you have about funding interdisciplinary jobs and positions that can uh, get marine social scientists working in the world? I would say I know it has to happen, but I don't know how to how to pull it off. Right? I I I, I know that that's that's very important. Um, I I know that the um, that no group such as Department of Fisheries and Oceans here in Canada is going to hire enough capacity to handle what I know to be the upcoming um, need in the future. Therefore, collaboration is um, is going to be a must. It's going to be a case of all hands to the pump. Uh, I would hope that we would be strategic by saying attracting some social science and humanities expertise from universities to coastal issues rather than, for example, working on other important issues such as forestry and mining and those kinds of things. Encourage people to the coast where I think there are very interesting um, questions for social sciences and humanities and where the teams can be formed that will help uh, coastal communities and, and coastal activities. Yeah, it, it also just a, um, a, a, there is this uh, a Mars Oxai, so um, a newsletter that M, M. McKinley is, uh, is running. And what I noticed is that there is often a huge list of, uh, of positions um, that are available kind of worldwide, right? So, so she kind of organized it. So I just wanted to say that from my observation, I have the feeling that there is an increase in positions for uh, marine social scientists to work. Um, having that said, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that there more can be done, as, of course. Yeah. Um, I, uh, uh, in Norway, I don't think that this is not a problem because there are the government recruit uh, from a broad base of people and in the in the ministries they they quite often will prefer people who have some sectoral knowledge and regardless of whether they are sociologists historians uh, uh, or or fisheries candidates but but uh, uh, so in a way that it, it has something to do practice is very is regarded as very important in Norway. So it's not, we do not have an academic 
tradition and that a paper from a university is, is worth nothing in this country if you don't have any other <laughs> other other experience that way for a medical doctor it, it means something but for a bureaucrat mm, you need to have something else also in addition so again these different cultures <laughs> Yeah, and we have a, a similar sort of uh, comment from uh, and question from Nathan Bennett, who points out that, you know, many government organizations and non-governmental organizations have trained natural sciences and scientists on staff, yet still only hire social science consultants part-time, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of data points on fish, but little little data on most social considerations. and. So how do we take organizations, whether in government or not, to take, how do we help organizations take real steps to advance and invest in social science personnel, capacity, research, and data systems? It's a bit similar, but perhaps broader. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that's also why I'm talking about we should build this 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 landscape or seascape um, um, and and kind of also uh, join join forces to kind of create those positions and create the need for those positions. I think I think it's something we need to develop. Um, I I started working um, at the Applied uh, Science Group uh, Wageningen Marine Research just simply because they uh, they were looking for so many people that they had a job um, job ad uh, saying if you want to come work with us write a letter and tell us what you want to do they were basically looking for 12 people at the same time in a in a biological ecological lab and there i was as a social scientist and was like hey that's cool i want to work at their institute and i wrote a letter explained i'm a social scientist this is what i want to do had a really cool uh, conversation with the boss, Tomo Bills, and then he hired me and he gave me the opportunity to, okay, try try to do what you want to do. And um, that's how it started. So yeah, maybe sometimes um, as a social scientist, you also just have to be a bit bold and say, hey, I want to work in this institute and this is my expertise and this is what I want to do and see, um, see if it works. So we have a question here uh, focusing more on uh, social, social ecological systems. You know, it's a relatively new approach still, um, and people are trying to find ways to understand what this means and how to do interdisciplinary research in that context. And uh, Miguel asks, what do we need in your view to do this effectively without leaving um, ecology and biology aside? Yeah, I, I guess I would go for the, the team approach um, and and work together. And, uh, and for instance, if you talk about uh, an ecosystem approach to fisheries management or projects that kind of have that uh, have that perspective, then I think you quite quickly understand that you you need to understand the ecosystem and whatever is happening there and all the processes, and you need to understand the social system and you need to understand how you bring that together. Um, and I'd say typically you would do that in, uh, as a team. And for instance, the uh, WG NARS, which is a, a working group um, working on the uh, integrated ecosystem approach uh, in Canada, America, they, they have a group of people with different backgrounds so, so that they can actually understand that ecosystem from these different perspectives. No, I, I I think, Evan, first recognizing that we are dealing with social ecological systems rather than just ecological systems is a big step and an important realization. Once that's realized, then getting consensus on the scope of that, the fact that it includes ecological, social, cultural, economic, and institutional or governance aspects is the second step. And then working from there, if that's recognized, then it becomes obvious that there's diverse objectives and those diverse objectives need to be informed um, appropriately. And that requires social sciences and humanities um, very importantly, and that they need to be put somehow on the, on the same page um, as in one of the slides that, um, that Mar Mar Marlos mentioned. It's coming though, it's coming, right? That, that this is, um, it was an, it was an anticipatory academic 
conversation 15 years ago, it's becoming mainstream, I believe, now. But as Marlos pointed out very well at the beginning, time is not on our side here. It has to happen fast. So therefore, I think it's incumbent on all of us to be proactive and be prepared, prepare ourselves for when they ask to form the team, right? <laughs> Who would you call, right? How would you work with them? Right? And recognizing you can't flip a switch on it. It takes, in the case of the Fisheries Research Network in Canada, it, it took us a couple of years to achieve um, uh, consensus uh, in an interdisciplinary team. And I think the experience is the same elsewhere. Maybe Marlos, you and, and Jan Petter could comment on that, but it's going to take time to develop the rapport among these interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary teams. We need to start on that right away. Jan Petter, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I think we, uh... I think we have we have moved forward there because I, when I was a student in the 80s, fisheries biology was about this is what is in the ocean. Now the marine scientists actually acknowledge that they are working on models that that the the the, the fish stocks are social constructs, and I think that's where the social and the ecological to some extent meet. That we have a we ac uh, acknowledge that we have a common ontological basis in, in con that we cons both construct the world. And, uh, and, but then we are moving into kind of hardcore academic discussions also. So the challenge is to bring this back and make it relevant for, for, for people. But I, I don't think it, I don't find it difficult to communicate for I've been working with a lot of with networks, actor network theory and things like that. And it's quite easy to explain for people who are actually harvesting fish that they are not an actor without all the resources that they need to act. It's quite logic for them. So, so there are ways around and, and, and ways of, of communicating this stuff. But we have, to, we have to work on the concepts and not just meet with the biology and the social science, but try to find this kind of, of, of common platform with some new concepts also. So um, I think we, we do have a few more questions, but I'm going to encourage those folks to reach out to our uh, wonderful presenter and, and, and uh, discussant today. But I'm going to ask you three um, if you have some concluding thoughts, some final comments uh, that you would like to pose uh, uh, and, and, and tell everybody here before we close out. Yeah, gosh, getting tired, guys. <laughs> but um, but maybe maybe I would just wanna wanna uh, reach out and say, you know, um, if you're not connected to Mara, if you're if you have never heard of WG Social, or if you're interested in participating in these networks, if you want to play a role, um, yeah, please step forward and connect. I think that's um, that's really important, um, and. Yeah, and, and just reiterate that I, I, I really enjoy, uh, as Jan said, kind of constructing and looking together for what are these concepts that kind of bring our worlds together and that we can together understand um, the problems that are lying in front of us. Because we, we, we can solve it alone as social scientists and, uh, and we definitely need a lot of natural science uh, 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 information so we have to really do it together and the same holds true for the natural scientists you can't solve climate change if you don't understand human behavior so we really have to work together and uh, and i'm looking forward to doing that thank you jan petter yeah i uh, i don't think i have much to add maybe we should not talk about social science and natural science maybe we should just talk about science <laughs> <laughs> Rob, you're muted. Apologies. Along the same lines, I'd like to pick up three things from uh, Marlos's uh, talk. First of all, the sense of urgency. Um, secondly, the notion of building bridges. And third, this notion of a seascape 
of science that's appropriate for social ecological systems. Mm. Uh, a seascape of science that includes uh, appropriately the, the social sciences and, and humanities. That's critical and I, and, and I would say everybody should think about their place in that. Wonderful. Well, um, I would like to thank uh, you, Marlos, for your great uh, presentation and, and wonderful uh, participation in the discussion. As well, I thank Rob and Jan Petter for your great discussant uh, comments and, and helping us round out this discussion in a really important way. Uh, you know, we have a few more of these really great uh, uh, seminars coming up. Our next installment of the speaker series is on February 16th. Uh, it's uh, leading, uh, leading the charge is Sherry Pictou from Dalhousie University, who will present on resurgent Mi'kmaq ancestral approaches to treaty relations and ocean governance. So thank you uh, to everyone and especially our attendees who asked really fantastic questions and, and and helped us talk a little further about advancing applied marine social sciences. So with that, I wish you a wonderful rest of your day and see you again. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you, Evan, for sharing this well. And uh, thanks, uh, Marlos and Petter. Nice to work with you. Thanks yeah. to Sam. It's really interesting to discuss yeah. with you. <laughs> we'll see you soon. <laughs> <Hope Yeah>. so. <laughs>